Jeannie. My God, Sadie Dean, what the heck is that background? Uh, well, this was an accident, I guess like a happy accident. Um, so you're welcome. But uh, thank you. Uh, usually, um, my writing partner and I we meet every Sunday, and he likes to add some flair to our conversation. So when I get in, he'll have like like the different like little like emojis or whatever on his face and a different background. And I don't know, like a month ago, I put this one up and I keep forgetting to change it out. So every time I open it up to you, I'm like, Nick. Hey, for, <laughs> for those caged. <laughs> for those listening in, Sadie Dean's background is she's caged in with Nick Cage all over her background with all different heads and all different sizes and all different directions. Next time, Sadie, I would like to see Ooh, we could make a background with like reckless creative mugs, like all behind us. I might have to do some sort of a custom background. Now yeah. we're getting fancy. Yeah, I like that. Ugh, do any of us have time for that? <laughs> no. I don't even prepare for content, for podcasts. I'm going to prepare a background? I don't think so, people. That's reckless, That's reckless thinking. Calm down, everyone. <laughs> this is not happening. <laughs> oh, Sadie Dean, how the heck have you been? I'm doing good. How are you doing, Jeannie? It's been a while. It has. And our apologies to our listeners that we have been remiss. I don't even know why we've been remiss, but we just have been. To be honest, like November just Where did that go? I was like looking at the counter. I was like, oh, well, this month is over. Everything mm -hmm. I had planned out, not happening. Including NaNoWriMo. <laughs> I, okay. So since we haven't talked in November, pretty much, I did do NaNo. I did not do it for the 50,000 words. So let's just be clear here. You so did it. Yet I start, I have, I have a NaNo account. <laughs> I got about 4,500 words written, but here's the good news. I started writing. That's good. You know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I thought about what my nano goals were actually, and they were never to do the 50,000. If I have were to be completely honest with our listeners, which I always am, my goal was about 15,000 words. And, um, and that would have been really, really awesome. But what happened was I sent the first couple thousand words to my publisher who loved them and said, keep going. And then I went to look something up because this is historical, you know, so I had to look some details up and I had pulled out this book that I had that I hadn't read yet and about that person and time period or whatever. And I've read a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of other stuff. So I thought, what do I need one more book for? I'm just going to get on with this. Well, this book, this dude lived in the middle of the 1700s and this book actually had a whole bunch of correspondence between him and other people in his life translated into English from Italian. So how could I not stop and read this book? So that's kind of what threw me off. And then I actually took over the weekend a Writer's Digest historical fiction class and um she gave really great tips her name is donna russo we could edit that in <laughs> i'll look up her name so i get it right and i'll put uh. it in the show notes um and she was lovely. And um, so she gave some great tips about finding stuff, which I don't want to go deeper into the research thing, but she great, gave a great tip about organizing your research and making a spreadsheet of the timeline of things going on in the world and then what it means to your character and all these different tabs on the spreadsheet. So I worked on that this weekend. So I'm making progress and organizing everything and then getting back to it. So this has not been a complete fail. It actually was a great success because I'm on it and it's in my head every day. So 
that was, that was by November. Well, that's good. That's productive, creatively productive. It was, it yeah. was. And I decorated for Christmas. Well, there you go. Do you cut down your own tree? We do. Wow. And okay. So we cut down our tree the weekend of Thanksgiving and the kids were home and we got some bizarre impromptu snowstorm. We had about eight inches here and wow. none of, none of, nobody was prepared for this. So the kids did not bring home boots and gloves and hats and nobody was prepared for this. Luckily I'm an Italian mother. So I have all those things. At the house. <laughs> and so I could bundle my little, my little kids up, but who are not little, but we get to the place that the tree is the trees, the tree place where we always go to cut down the trees. There's 16 inches of snow. Like nobody had boots for that crap. Like what? And then you have to like shake the tree for those referring who listen our regular listens, shake a genie. <laughs> had to shake the tree to see if it was even a decent tree. Took well. <laughs> so you do that on Thanksgiving day or is that the day the weekend, before? The, the weekend. weekend. Okay. The weekend after and that's only because the kids are here so right and we want to torture Thanks. them and make them go look for trees and then we'd see people like my kids are in their 20s we'd see people with kids who are like little toddlers um who were just laying down in the snow and the pain and you could tell they're all miserable and <laughs> i went up to one woman i'm like it gets better just hang in there. <laughs> everybody thinks these are like these fun family, kumbaya, hot cocoa. No, this is a chore that you're just doing to cross off the list. Yeah. Well, that's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have snow in Los Angeles. Or it would be all over Nicolas Cage's face. <laughs> what? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I want to say, uh, I just want to plug the symposium you guys did last week. Ooh. Uh, Hard Truths. It was awesome. Oh, I'm glad loved you liked it. it. So loved it so much. Great panelists. Great, great moderators. Uh, I, I definitely recommend all of our listeners to sign up for those symposiums because it's, some, it's, good, it's good stuff. Really we good stuff. Thank you. We our first one we failed to record, so apologies to everyone. But that was that a good was, one too. That was a good one too. That was with our staff, uh, pipeline mm -hmm. staff, and we were talking like hard truths about screenwriting, and literally like all the stuff nobody tells you, and maybe we crushed a few souls. So it might be good that we didn't record it. <laughs> but it's all the stuff like I always say. Tell me what I need to hear, not what you think I want to hear. And it's all the stuff that like, if you know that stuff, you go in more informed and prepared and for the emotional mess of it all. The second one we did was Hard Truths Publishing and that one is recorded. And that was really good all about the publishing industry. And then the, the one we did last week was Hard Truths Filmmaking. And um, that was awesome because we had all different perspectives of like big box office and indie and, you know, right. Working for hire. And um, so that was really good, cool. And those are, those two are on the um, pipeline artist YouTube channel. So if you want to go watch those, um, but we're going to have, since we're in the plug mode, we're going to have a new symposium. We're doing a combination now launching in January, January of paid and free. Not sure what our free one is going to be for this January yet. Um, we're bouncing around a couple of different really cool ideas. We might end up doing a couple of free ones. Um, and then the paid one is going to be with um, Chantal and Mia Asman, who is an editor at Agora Press, talking about, um, and when I say paid, we are not expensive. Not expensive. So um, we like things to be affordable for all artists because we're all starving. And also because the topic of today's podcast is let's talk about money. Yeah. So yeah. Um, money's important. And she's going to be talking about how 
not to focus on just launching your book, like your debut novel or whatever. How do you launch your career? Like, you know, so all the things you need to think about beyond that first book. Um, so it's going to be really cool. And Chantel is awesome. She's a friend of mine. I met her at Seth Rogers Writers Conference. I've known her for years. She's so full of knowledge. It's crazy. Um, but yeah, money. Yeah. Sign me up for that one. I'm in. Take my yeah. money. Yeah. Yeah. Take my money. <laughs> so yeah, well, that's, I think, I think, I think January 12th. So, um, but you'll, we haven't put it up on the website yet. So, um, but just follow us on Twitter at Pipeline Artists and I will be tweeting that thing out. Yeah. Chantel yeah. also does Words of Prey podcast for us. So if you guys want to get a peek into her fabulous brain, go listen to that. And that's free. Yeah, that is free. <laughs> we like free. Yeah. Yeah. Paying for things is nice too. I do it, pay for it things. Makes you, it makes you feel like um, there's more of like an urgency that you actually have to follow through if you pay for something. So it's a good little motivator. I actually, people, you know, have talked about this that all the time, like that debate of should you pay to learn? Should you like all that kind of stuff? Like screenwriting should be like John August and Craig Mazin are famous for being like, nothing should cost anything. Screenwriting should be free. You can go, there's plenty of scripts to read online, blah, 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 which is true. There's a lot you can learn for nothing. Mm -hmm. But I kind of look at it as like, if I hire an editor or if I hire a you know, story consultant or whatever, I kind of look at all of that as like, just like I did when I hired a physics tutor for my kids, like, and I need a fresh set of eyes. And sometimes I don't have a friend available or sometimes I kind of feel like maybe I want another level, you know, or if I'm taking a class, I look at classes like, um, if I, like I look at cookbooks, like, okay, nobody buys cookbooks anymore. Like, come on, it's on the internet. Everything's on the internet. Free. But, free. But back in the day when I bought cookbooks, because I used to, our listeners may not know, I used to run a motel and restaurant for 15 years. So done a lot of cooking in my lifetime and cleaning toilets um, and fixing I toilets. To <laughs> Learn more about your cleaning. Okay. So when we talk about money, I'm going to give you an, a tip, a tip. Whenever you have like a plumber come over or electrician, this is what I used to do at the motel. I was also in my twenties and cute. So they liked it when I followed them around and I would act like, Oh, what are you doing? <laughs> and I would watch, I'm very mechanically inclined. So I would watch what they were doing. And then the next time, whatever it was broke, I wouldn't call them. I would just go fix it myself. Nice way to save money. So yeah. do the same thing in your own household, follow those workers around and learn because it's not rocket science people. And if it makes you feel better, show the crack of your butt in your pants when you bend over. <laughs> crack dealers, that's what I call them. Oh God, they said like all these little, <laughs> what are we talking about? Everyone get your plumber a belt for Christmas. Yes, that's a great and win-win win for everyone. That's a great idea. Yeah. But don't get them cookies. Because if you get them cookies and a belt, the belly is just going to get bigger and the belt's going to get lowered. So yeah, just the belt. <laughs> Maybe some slim fast and a belt. <laughs> Although my plumber is fit and trim. I've never seen his crack. Thank you very much. <laughs> Congratulations. Oh God. Reckless creatives. Talking about paid classes uh, and paying for someone's professional input. Definitely. Uh, there is a difference, I think, than what you could get for free online versus someone's knowledge and years of experience doing it. Yeah. And there's also, 
a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of free stuff out there. That's great. Yeah. Like, and most, you know, um, so I think that that's, there's, and also too, when we're talking about money, are we ready to talk about money? Are we talking about like money, NFTs, cryptocurrency? <laughs> we're talking about, we're going to give you Bitcoin tips. <laughs> Never. Cause Never. I don't, I cannot figure that out. I don't understand it. My husband is like in the banking industry. He keeps trying to explain to me this cryptocurrency. And I'm like, can I hold it? Nope. Then it's just out there. How is it real? I don't understand this, but that's not what our topic, but I'm just saying, don't pay me in Bitcoin. Cause I don't know what the hell that is. Yeah. No, thank you. Just give me For cold, now. hard cash, buddy. One of the things I think is really, since we're talking about free, when you first start writing and you're, you're doing stuff, people always say, you know, it's like, oh, don't write for free. Don't write for free. Cause you know, whatever. It's okay to write for free for a little while in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Not a screenplay. I mean, obviously you write a spec script for free, but not like that kind of level of writing. I'm talking about like articles, you know, book reviews, movie reviews, you know, whatever. Because if you're just starting off, okay, let's stop for a second. Eh, put the brakes on. Time out. Time out. Just want to clarify when we say, let's talk about money. We're talking about day jobs, so you can still be creative. So stay tuned for that. Not that I have any idea what I'm gonna say about it, <laughs> but I got thoughts probably somewhere deep in my head. And also like freelance jobs, like how you can make money as a writer, but also how you can make money to pay your bills while you're doing your art, even if your day job is not, it doesn't have anything to do with the arts. Mm -hmm. Was there any other topics on the money that you wanted to address, Sadie, so people have some frame of reference of where we're going here? Uh, no. <laughs> we have no idea. We don't know where we're going. <laughs> Somehow. I just, I, I just want to like fast forward to the conversation that we're going to have because I know it's going to be amazing. I'm just so excited. <laughs> so we have no idea what we're talking about. Uh, yeah, the... I. I will say like this, this idea for this topic came from an article I read in a guitar magazine I was reading. Um, I'm now just catching up on all my magazine reading from like three, four years ago. So I'm catching up. And uh, there was one about, uh, it was from the editor of this magazine and just saying like, to all the musicians out there who get made fun of for having a day job, like don't let that bring you down. Like keep doing it, like keep creating, keep playing your guitar, keep practicing, go ahead and buy those things. If it makes you feel like a better player or whatever it is, but like do keep your day job so that you can pay for these things. And hopefully you'll get to a, a, a place in your, if that's what you want to do is be a professional player or in this case, like a professional writer or whatever it is, um, your creative thing is, um, like don't feel ashamed of having a day job because um, I guess some uh, people had written in like, oh, I'm, I work at a bank. And when I go to like a jam session and they're like, oh, what do you do? And he's like, I'm a banker. Like, oh, you suck. <laughs> you work for the man or whatever. It's like, why aren't you playing guitar 24 seven? It's like, well, I wouldn't be able to afford that. Like, I can't do that. So, or if you're a waiter. A trust fund. Or, yeah. Yeah. So. I mean, I think like, it's like, you know, get it in where you can, but you do need that day job. Um, and I know a lot of writers uh, who are pretty successful in the spec side. And um, sometimes that just doesn't keep the lights on, you know, years on end. You got to keep some kind of form of income. Uh, hopefully it's something that doesn't like kill your soul while you're doing it. But um, I think that's the... 
I think that's the key. It's like fine if you've got to have a day job. I have a day job. Sadie has a day job. Um, if you've if you've got to have a day job, which most people do, unless you have a spouse that makes a ton of money and is like, no, you just create art. Who has does this person exist? I think so. I think they're out there. They are out there. I I I know people who have such mythical creatures in their lives. <laughs> <laughs> but um it's finding the job that doesn't suck your soul so that you still have the energy to write. I don't know if I've ever told this story of reckless creators before and I might have, you will be able to tell me if I have, um, but my dad used to work for the budget division for Chicago, the city of Chicago in uh, something to do with the police budgets and stuff like that. And Peter Falk worked for him from the guy who starred in Columbo. Did I tell that story? I feel like it sounds familiar, but yeah, I don't know if I told it just to you or if I told it to the audience. I don't know, but I'll do it fast in case I have. And I apologize if I've told the story before. Cliff notes, just give you the cliff notes. Basically, bottom line, Peter was um, doing doing uh, theater at the time. He wanted to be an actor, but he had a day job and um, in you know the budget division over there. So he's, you know, mathematical, crunching numbers, blah, 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 blah. And, but he would act at night. So that's an example of like, you know, probably paid decent money and he was acting at night until one day he came into work in his pajama top because he, the, the theater went late, he was tired and he just kind of was late for work, ran in, whatever. And my dad like pulled him into the office and um, said, what do you want to do? Peter, do you want this as your career or do you want acting as your career? Because at some point, it's okay to do them both, but at some point you're going to have to make a decision. Like it's going to be, it's going to bleed too much into your day life. And maybe that pajama top might be a sign. (laughs) I don't know how far, how long after that conversation. And I'm certainly not crediting my dad as being the person who (laughs) pushed Peter into acting, but it was a conversation that was had and Peter ended up quitting while my dad was there. And which was very upsetting to my mother because she had a big crush on him and she'd come into the office, <laughs> but she continued that's to thoroughly. Dad, that's why your dad had to talk with him. I yeah. do think that might that's have had some his creative career. It's like, you need to leave. You need to get out. My yeah. wife is eyeing you, yeah. get out. Yeah. And, um, but my mother, never missed a Columbo episode. Let me tell you that. (laughs) (laughs) Nor did my father. He loved the show. That's how I, you know, whatever. So, and who knows, my father may have embellished the story. I don't know. He's gone. I can't ask, but it was always a fun story. So, but that's an example of at some point when you're creating your art, it's going to, the scales are going to tip and I think you'll know it. I think you'll know when it's time to get rid of the full-time job and start doing the art. Yeah, or it doesn't feel like you're chasing it. Or you're just- Chasing chasing a dream. Tired all day. You can start living the dream. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And it's exhausting because I think you're, when you're in it and you're in a day job, especially one that you don't like, Like I have friends who have those physically exhausting jobs um, where they're, you know, really very physical all day long. And then at night they're just tired. And I have found with a writing routine, I've done a couple different things for squeezing writing in while I'm, you know, working. Most of Pipeline is West Coast, although now we have a bunch of us on the East Coast, but, So I will try to sneak in writing in the morning because my mind is fresh. I can get more done in 30 minutes at 8 a.m. than I could at 8 p.m. for 30 minutes. Um, Not, no, I can edit articles at eight o'clock at night, but I can't write. Um, Some people write during their lunch hour and 
when I found myself being the most productive is when I could guard my weekends for writing and um, just, just focus on work Monday through Friday, not even try. And then weekends, right. What do you do, Sadie? None of that. <laughs> uh, no, I used to be, uh, when I had an off, like an in office job, I would work uh, typically during my lunches, I would write if I had the opportunity. Um, now I weekends are writing time because I'm just working constantly. Mm -hmm. um, but I do both writing and music. So music is on weeknights for rehearsals and I try to practice every day if I can, just a little bit. Um, but writing, I definitely have like a guarded Sunday every Sunday is writing unless something crazy comes up, but, um, and that's with my writing partner. So we have that scheduled out. And then if we are like ready to start writing the actual said thing, we'll, you know, use our weeknights and I'll shift things around, but kind of just trying to get it in when I can. And then also like the, I would say like the, the nice thing of working from home now is like, I can take the 10 minutes to jot something down if it's on, you know, circling in my head, um, and then get back to work. But I'm kind of like on the same page with you. Like mornings are really great for just diving in for writing because you don't you're not worried about the emails and all that crazy stuff, work stuff, um, and then editing later on in the day. I gotta just say, danger, danger, Will Robinson. When you sit at your laptop and your intention is to just write for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and that's it, and then get to work. The minute you open your email, it's over. Don't do it. Don't do it. Maybe yeah. you just put a big post-it note on your computer before you go to bed. Do not open the email because then you're down the abyss. Oh, yeah. I'll just do this. Oh, I'll just do that. Oh, I'll just check this. Oh, nope, nope, nope. No. Yeah. Somebody, somebody actually tweeted me last night because on script chat last night, we were talking about, you know, finding time to write and blah, 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 which kind of all goes into money. I mean, it's kind of all mangled together. They said they deleted their Facebook app on their phone and yeah. that, that really helped them, you know? Um, yeah. Don't look at your phone the first thing in the morning. Don't, don't look at Twitter. It's yeah. Okay. It will, it will, it, it will be there. Yeah. It's not yeah. going. Yeah. yeah. And, um, there was something else I was going to say, but I'm It'll so distracted by Nicholas Cage's face. <laughs> yeah. I wonder, I wonder how he feels about knowing that there's images like that out there. <laughs> he probably loves it. He's probably like, yeah. Yeah. What else do you guys need? I mean, I guess the next thing I could do is like your face. <laughs> Put my face everywhere. Please don't. Um, but does he get paid for his likeness? Probably not. Mm. That's a good question. I know because I know a lot of like actors have been screwed. <laughs> like uh, what's her name from, um, I can't believe I'm, Carrie Fisher. Uh, she didn't own her likeness. Oh. Isn't that crazy? How is that not even, how, how, how could someone not own their own likeness? Like yeah. you filed paperwork for that? Yeah, I guess it was just in her contract or something when she was doing Star Wars. Oh. Um, so, you know, like, you know, like kids, like uh, toys, like action figures and stuff from movies. Sometimes it'll kind of look like the actor. It's because they don't own a likeness, which is better for the actor well Sadie I think we have to have a contract with Matt that we own our likeness like <laughs> yeah yeah I'm putting it in writing putting that put that in writing just tell I him own, no I own my face our faces are not allowed on pipeline bugs <laughs> like, let's just <laughs> put that in our contract I don't think if they he would sell to, he would have to pay us <laughs> that's right yeah. which he's not gonna yeah. do now. Yeah. Oh, Lordy. Okay. So <laughs> jobs, 
like I think I, I like the point you were making before about people kind of making you feel guilty about that like aren't you not real artist unless you're starving and you know all that kind of stuff I mean I'd say with my job my biggest problem is I love my job how dare <laughs> like, you how dare I like yesterday was Sunday right and I'm sitting yeah. there trying to work on my big spreadsheet for my historical data and I'm in slack messaging Matt and Ruth about a symposium idea I had and he's like oh that's great and then like we're going back and forth the three of us and I'm like it's Sunday like is there something wrong with us <laughs> no I think that's awesome we like our jobs yeah yeah when you're passionate about your work that's awesome and then if you could carry that over into your own personal creative self that's like a double bonus because it's hard if you're if you're doing like a desk job all day looking at a computer like we do it's kind of hard to like okay now i'm going to pivot to this other screen <laughs> and write and it's just like my eyes hurt i have a headache my hands hurt or you know it's just like i now i don't have time for myself to do this thing so you kind of have to just make sure you have this time and space for yourself to do the five minutes ten minutes whatever it is full day weekend day or whatever so some in. somebody was saying i think it was last night that they go somewhere else to write like if they're if they're like so i don't this is my office in my house but i don't write like i don't work up here like i come up here to do podcasts and have zoom meetings and stuff like that but i don't do my day job up here um but i have come up here i don't always do it, but I have come up here to write because, and I think it's because I don't do my day job up here and it's quiet. There's no TV, there's no, you know, whatever. So I've come up here and I also have, I don't have any, I don't have my story up on my whiteboard, but I have that big three foot by five foot whiteboard in my office that I use to break story. And um, so I, I think if you have that place, like I, I can come right here, but I'm very fortunate that my mind lets me write anywhere. Like I don't have to have a certain place that I write. I know of some people who have to have a certain place where they write and that's very limiting for them because the pandemic is one person I, I know who he always writes in his office at his home. Well, during the pandemic, he left New York City and went somewhere else because New York was the epicenter went somewhere else for a year and really struggled that year because he felt like out of place, like, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but I do like to, when I, this is a whole other conversation. I don't know why I'm going down this, but when I edit, I like to print it out and there's like one chair I like to sit in in a quiet room in my house that I, you know, write little notes all over what I'm doing, but that's yeah. a different conversation. There is something about like removing yourself from your like workspace, like mm -hmm. your job space, because now a lot of people do work from home and finding another space in your home, wherever it is to feel like that's like your creative, like safe zone. Um, sometimes I'll like, I'll grab my laptop and I'll just sit on the couch and write, you know, um, I used to like in college, would always go to the library and cause it was just like, you have to be quiet you can't go on the internet. <laughs> you have to write. And, and I would pump out a lot of pages. Um, but now it's like, I don't like going anywhere. This pandemic kind of did me and I'm just like, uh, I'm just going to stay in my little and I, bubble. And I think to the point of our conversation about money, jobs, art, all that, with a lot of people working from home, I think it makes it, everybody thinks, oh, this is great. I can be in my pajamas all day. And and I don't have travel time. I'm saving, look at all the gas mileage I'm, I'm saving, the gas money and mileage on my car, which is all true. Um, but then you have, then there's a different set of problems. You're, mm -hmm. you know, where do you go to be creative? Where do you, when do you stop working? You know, like there's not, there's a lot of gray area, <laughs> you know, like if you're doing some laundry in the morning and you're starting work kind of late, then it's like, yeah, you work a little late. Well, then if you're working a little late, then you're too tired to create. Like, it's like this whole, it's, it can be very challenging 
to find that creative space when you're working from home and to create those kind of boundaries. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there's like something with accountability, which kind of goes back to like Mm -hmm. paying for classes. Like you're like, well, I'm fronting all this money, but either it be 20 bucks to $300, like you have to show up. Whereas if you're on your own, you're just kind of like, oh, I'll just keep pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And the next thing you know, it's like three years later, and you're like, ah, I was going to do that creative thing, but ah, I'll just put like, what's another three years? <laughs> like yeah. three years already went by, I'll just keep pushing it. Um, yeah, that's, it's tough. I'm not gonna and I, ha- I have to say, as I get older, a number which we shall not say, um, I do look back and think about the time I wasted. Mm. You know, you kind of think you've got all the time in the world and you really don't. It goes fast and it goes, especially like like I lost my dad in 2019. I think that's kind of what made me start thinking about my longevity and, you know, like how long will I last and what can I do in that time? And, um, I think youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> yes. Be like old grandma saying that. <laughs> it's, it's true though. I mean, I've, I've, I do the same thing. Um, I'm not much younger than you. Yeah. <laughs> You're not much uh, older than me. Um, I don't think I, I could be your I, mother. So that's, that's a good start. Well, depending on what state. Shut up. In. Shut up. <laughs> shut up uh, <laughs> no but shut I do look back up. you know like 10 years ago it's like 10 years ago if I had that energy and spirit now I think I'd be better off but like looking back it's like okay over the last 10 years what have I done and I feel like yes I could have done more but also there's life happens and you can't be too hard on yourself for the bumps in the road but okay the the youth the youth can do so much more and I think some of them do with like TikTok and all that that's creative right oh maybe 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 okay (laughs) so I agree the youth are the youth have got it all except they don't realize that they've got it all yeah and um which I include myself in that when I was in my twenties, I didn't realize like, like I remember when I, when my son um, graduated Penn state, we got him all set up in his apartment. He's got his job, blah, blah, blah. And I remember we got him all moved in. I remember driving back to our house saying to my husband, he doesn't even realize it, but he is in the best. This is the best time of his life. (laughs) He's single. He's got a good job. He's got an apartment. He's got money in the bank. He's like, he's got it all. And he doesn't realize it. And, you know, which is fine. You know, you don't know what you don't know. Um, But I'm going to just say, if I could go back in time, that made me think about like jobs, money, you know, practicality of of wanting to be a writer. My problem was I didn't realize I wanted to be a writer until I was 40. Which so, was like a year or something, which right? Which was six months ago. And I can see people right now pulling out their calculators. Well, if I know she worked at Script Magazine for 10 years <laughs> and I know that she did, right? Yeah, I'm old. And um, so my father worked for, he retired at 65. He worked for the state of New York. He was the chief budget examiner and he worked there for 30 years. Um, There was a woman who was his secretary when she was 18. So this was when my dad first started. So she started working for the state at 18. And I think by the time she was uh, 40, so 38, she had already had 20 years in so 48 she had 30 years in so by the time she was 50 she retired and she was making she had had many she's very smart woman she had a lot of promotions along the way so she was working in the budget division with him she was making six figures in retirement at 50 years old and she was done 
why didn't my father tell me to do that? <laughs> That's what I want to like shake him and say, why didn't you tell me to do that? I know why intellectually, because yeah. he said to me, nobody liked to apologize, apologies to any New York state workers listening to this. But he was like frustrated because people weren't working hard people and then it would get political the higher you get up it gets political and if they don't if you know they don't like you 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 know whatever mm -hmm. but it's a steady job with great benefits at all those kinds of jobs like that doesn't mean you have to everybody needs to move to new york state and work for new york state but like a lot of states are like that municipalities or even just a corporate job like you work for GE or you know one of the big corporations and you start in your 20s then you've got a decent pension and you can have a completely second career later and mm -hmm. if I was making you know even just 50 grand a year and being retired at 50 mm -hmm. giddy up <laughs> but that's not my life yeah so that's I don't, the other thing. I don't think that's the lifestyle for you, though. Like sometimes people go on different paths for a reason. Are you trying to make me feel better? Always. <laughs> okay. Then this also makes me want to say this, which is going down a path that I have no knowledge of whatsoever, but I'm just going to say it because I think it's important to say it. If you're an artist and you're um, like, I have a lot of friends who have their own businesses. Um, so say you're an artist and you create stuff on Etsy and, you know, or you're, a uh, an editor or script consultant in your, your own business, you should always also be thinking about how are you going to retire? Like you need to like have a little nest egg. You need to save a little money on the side. Like think about a 401k, get an accountant, get some tax advice. I mean, that's the stuff like as artists nobody talks about like they don't talk about like all the tax write-offs you can get and you know like say i'm writing this historical fiction book i could fly to italy and write it off and mm -hmm. you know it's like so think of so also think about that like there's ways that you can handle your money that might even just give you a little tax break. Like you can, if you're a freelance writer, like say you have your day job, okay? I'm gonna give you a little, little thoughts here, to think about. Say you've got your day job, but you want to, to also start freelancing. So you write some articles, you pitch them, you might sell an article. Well, as soon as you start selling articles, that little office, the square footage of your office space, you can start writing some of that off you know get an account that you buy movie tickets movie tickets film festival entries festival. all of it all of it get a good accountant or get a good account. or make your money and live your life to the fullest and spend it on everything that you want live that <laughs> gluttonous life and then just kind of fizzle out with old age you won't have any money for the nursing home. I don't need it. You know what else is <laughs> really there. expensive? I'm go there for visiting hours as an old person to get my free cello and stuff and then leave. I got it all figured out. You know what else is really expensive? Children. <laughs> so don't have children. <laughs> <laughs> I could say, no, I, I would, I... You know what's really great about children is when they grow up and you have adult children. Though they're really fun. Yeah. They're really fun. So, but that's something else. It's like a reality. Like when people start off in their 20s and they're like, I'm gonna be an artist, blah, 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 blah. They get married. Okay, this is great. Now I've got two incomes for the household. This is good. And then somebody says, Let's have a baby. Or let's buy a house. Yeah. So now you've got the mortgage and you've got the kids and then all of a sudden where do you fit your writing time in because you need to spend time with your family and and if i can just now give advice to all those people in that position who keep putting off family time because you're going to go right 
stop doing that <laughs> because your kids grow up really, really fast and you want them to remember being with you and spending time with you. And also if you don't nurture your marriage, that's not going to turn out very well. So make sure you pay attention to that. But it's also really, really, and that now I'm not saying, don't interpret that as I'm saying, put your writing on hold. You can't do both. That's bullshit. I'm not saying that. I think it's when you have kids, I think it's super cool for your kids to see you going after your dream. Super cool. And they will be a lot more understanding about you taking time to write. And they will be the first people to be super proud of you when you sell something, an article, anything. They will be, it's a great example to set for them that you can, you can be a functioning member of society in a traditional sense of a regular job that you hate or love or whatever, but also pursue your art. There's a lot of different sides to every person and it's really good for kids to see that. Yeah. And it's good. And if you write children's books or if you write anything that they can give you input on, they get super jazzed about it and they get excited. And then you're creating little artists, but hopefully, yeah. hopefully they'll be really successful. <laughs> Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I actually like the first person I think of is I give a shout out to my, my mother who basically did that. She was a single mom for many years and she is this amazing artist, but she also had to like have a day job and take care of me <laughs> who was around. And, uh, but to see her be able to like, you know, she did all kinds of wacky jobs just to put food on the table, but like she worked at like a catering business and then she was able to like at night then work on her music and then do shows and make money from that. And, you know, um, it's worked out in her favor, you know, over the years, but like seeing that as a kid and being like, okay, I think I'm a creative too. And having that person to like share those things with too. So like now, like I'll, I'll write a song and I'll send it to her. She's usually the mm. first person to get her input because it's, you know, that's what we grew up doing, but yeah, it's, um, it made me also like and like appreciate appreciate the worth of like a day job too because it's like mm -hmm. why need this to like facilitate this other thing that I hope someday will become my livelihood. Um, yeah, I kind of have to set the example, I guess, as the adult in that situation. So yeah, and I think it's like whether you like find a day job that you like or not is like it's not like. Sadie and I can sit here and say, these are the kinds of jobs that you should take because we can't, because everybody's different. Like if you're, there's, there's a lot of writers who are doctors or lawyers or scientists and those fields don't seem like they're creative, but think about the knowledge that they're gaining to then go write a police procedural or whatever, you know what I mean? Like there's so much knowledge that they get from their day job and you know, it depends on what you're getting out of your day job. What is it about your day job that feeds your soul that mm. then helps you be creative? Like I can answer that question at Pipeline. The thing that I love besides, you know, the people I work with who are so smart and they know story and they're all writers and creatives themselves. So it's just interesting to have conversations with them. But um what I really love about my job is helping people. Mm -hmm. So I like helping writers. I like giving them content to read on Pipeline Artists that's, that's um, inspiring in some way or interesting and entertaining. And, um, and now with Symposium, I just like, it's like why I've done script chat since 2009. I like helping people. So if, if I'm helping people, and also I like that it's in the industry. So mm -hmm. I can learn about publishing. I can learn about more about screenwriting. I'm always learning. Like I never ever feel like I know everything there is to know about. This. No, there's mm -hmm. always something to learn. And so I could find another job. The, the, the bar for me would be, can I learn? Can I be challenged? Can I continue to grow? And can I help people? So for me, those are the things that are necessary to be happy. And a paycheck's great too. Um, yeah. And 
that, but the, so you have to answer those questions for yourself. Like, what is it that would make you happy in a job? And because if you're happy in your job, you're going to be um, less emotionally and mentally drained mm -hmm. to totally. create. Or yeah. if you're unhappy, you might be super inspired to create so you can get the hell out of that job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, the people always bag on actors who, are, you know, and especially in LA, it's like, if you're a waiter, you have a waiter and you're like, oh, are you an actor? It's not a surprise if they're like, yes, I am. But there is something to it because it's such a, it's a job that you can just come in, you leave it at the workplace and you have that flexibility, hopefully to go and chase that dream to hopefully make that your livelihood be an actor or whatever it is. Um yeah, I know a lot of people who do that and it's paid off. I mean, for those who want the day to create, you know, you can make a pretty decent living being a bartender if yep. you live in a city that has a big nightlife. I've known many writers, directors, producers, all of the above who were bartenders, uh, worked in catering, worked in, you know, whatever it is, some kind of service industry because you just leave it there and you have that flexibility, hopefully, to do your own creative stuff. I remember when I first got the job offer to be uh, editor at Script Magazine, I remember telling Doug Richardson, writer of Die Hard 2, Bad Boys Hostage, he said, are you really sure you want to take that job? Because, and then he goes, can you do it? Do you think you can get all your work done in just 20 hours a week? I'm waiting for Sadie to spit out her water across the thing. That would be a no. Um, no. No. And um, can you add more time to the calendar? Is that possible? Exactly. And um, but he said to me, think long and hard before you take this job because I know you'll be good at it. I know you'd like it, but just think about it. Because if you took a job that was like being a waitress or going to work at retail or whatever, you can walk away. There's no, no, you don't take the job home because there's nothing to take home. You, you're done. Your shift is over. You leave. He goes in, he's like, there's a, and just to your point, he's like, there's a reason actors and writers or waiters, you know, coffee baristas, you know, whatever, because they can turn it off and leave. And mm -hmm. so that may be something that you prefer, you know, doing something like that, something that's not, you know, a traditional career, something that's more of like a, you know, stopgap kind of job. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's, I think finding the, the right job that allows you to still be creative is a very independent thing. Some people can be more creative if they feel financially secure mm -hmm. and stable. So it helps them to have a more traditional job and other people can feel more creative when they just know that I just need time to be creative. So I want to guard this time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And be smart about handling your finances. I want to go back to the writing for free because I didn't really, I started that and then I went, eh, time out. <laughs> and we're back. And we're back. <laughs> We had a great conversation during our break. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, um, writing for free. When I, I ran a motel and restaurant for 15 years, and then I took five years to be a mom. And then I was like, then my kids were in school. And that's when I was like, I've always wanted, you know, I always want to be a writer, you know, and then one of my college friends said, do it, let's do it, do it. So, which I'm forever thank grateful to her for encouraging me. And um, so what I thought, I got a Twitter account and I started learning everything I could about writing in that community because I live in the country. So it was a way for me to have like a writer's water cooler kind of thing. And um, I started following Jane Friedman, who's, um, big in the publishing industry. If you don't go to Jane, if, if you're in publishing and, and a novelist, you should have janefriedman.com bookmarked. Yeah. Straight yeah. up. Yeah. And she teaches a lot for Writer's Digest too, which is like so cool. 
as a matter of fact, so I cool. was since we were we were talking about classes before. I noticed I got I was digging clean out my email account and there's a class Jane has coming up for WDU about um, getting your book published in 2022, and that looks really good. Yeah, really good. So anyway, plug for Jane. Yeah. Um, and I actually did a really in depth interview of her on Pipeline Artists, the book so, of Jane. Also, so good. Read it. Yeah. She talked about having Wonder Woman under ruse. So <laughs> <laughs> go read that. Um, but she, you know, obviously acquired articles from Writer's Digest when she was running that and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And I started thinking, well, I want to. I want to be a freelance writer because I'm like, we're, now it's like, I knew I didn't want to go back into the motel and restaurant business after 15 years of doing that. That was very draining. And I had little kids. I didn't want to be waitressing at night. I didn't want to manage a restaurant. I went to Cornell hotel school. So I was, you know, I didn't want to, any kind of management position in that kind of industry. You're working holidays, you're working weekends. That is not conducive to a family. So I wasn't interested in doing that. I thought I want to get into writing. So maybe I'll start writing some articles and I'll start doing some freelance work. Um, a lot harder than you think. It's a hustle. You know, you're getting paid 50 bucks at a time and a lot of sites don't even want to pay you. So I thought, should I be writing for free? Like I had this like quandary of like, what is the point of this? I'm trying to make money. So what is the point? Well, you need what they call published clips to prove that you can write. Like people don't want to hire you unless you've written, somebody else has hired you first. So writing for free is a really good way to get those published clips. And so then create a website, put those clips up there on your website, like a tab where it says like clips or whatever. So people, so when people find you on Twitter, other writers, whatever, you can, they'll go check out your site and they'll see, oh, she's really a writer. And it makes you, especially when you're first starting out, it makes you feel like a writer because you've been published somewhere. And um, turns out I met Jane on Twitter and she ended up giving me my, the biggest break ever, which was my very first published article in Writer's Digest about confessions of a tweetaholic. So, you know, finding that person who believes in you and gives you this break, right? So that I get paid for. Thank you, writers, judges. And, but the stuff that I was writing that I wasn't getting paid for, what I would say to people was, if it was a site that got good traffic, if it was a site that I thought people would be reading and hearing my voice, and as long as I could write the article, I mean, obviously I wrote the article how I was assigned to, but if I had any leeway, and frankly, when you're writing for free, you kind of do. Mm -hmm. Always try to use my writer's voice, like really showcase who I am that would set me apart. And then I would ask them, since they weren't paying me, um, go to my LinkedIn and please leave me a recommendation. So at least I was getting something for it. Like I was getting a, rec a professional recommendation and a published clip that I could use as a sample for someone else for the next level up. And then you get to a point that it's like, okay, now I don't write for free anymore. So next level up. But there are sites that I would absolutely write for free. You know, like if Jane Friedman said to me, hey, Jeannie, I need a screenwriting article. I would write the hell out of that for free for her. <laughs> you know, like, so it, it just depends, you know, it, de it depends on what it is. But at some point you say, there's value to me in my words and my work and my voice. So now you need to pay me. But that's individual. That's up to each person. Personally, I, you know, I can totally understand why people would say I will never write for free. And people who write for free actually are devaluing me because you'll do it for free, but I won't. So now you're making it harder for me. I get that argument too. A hundred percent. I totally get it. It's not, it's not a black and white thing. You know, for me personally, I was okay doing it for free because I figured out once I figured out I'll ask for a recommendation then all of a sudden I felt more comfortable mm -hmm. but now I don't really do it anymore but so um don't immediately say no think what can I get out of this how can I spin this how can I make this feel and be something of valuable value to me too because then you can get more freelance jobs and more freelance jobs and it turns into and last thing about writing articles Although I can't promise it'll be the last thing. 
you writing an article can show people you know how to tell a story. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. There's a resolution. There's something you've conveyed through it. And you can put your writing voice into it. So back to Doug Richardson, he ended up reading one of my screenplays because he was reading my articles on Script Magazine and my articles on my own website. And he said, this girl can tell a story. I want to see how she writes a script. So writing articles, that's why to me, writing them for free still had value because it was putting my words out there for somebody to find. Like I don't get paid to write. I don't write on my blog anymore, but I obviously wasn't getting paid to do that, but people were reading it and then getting interested in me as a writer. Yeah. It also helps your, your, your building your portfolio, which is mm -hmm. important. Um, and more often than not, I mean, a lot, if you're looking to start getting paid for your work, I mean, a lot of people don't know what you're being paid for or not. So like, it could look like you got paid for yeah. all of the work. I mean, but it's also good. I think it's a good thing to do when you're first starting out, if you're just trying to get in there and get your foot in the door with certain people, like, why not go write and that review? Sadie and I keep threatening to have an episode about feedback and notes. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. We even had that in via text last week. <laughs> Could this be the one where we talk about notes? Um, but Speaking, yeah. of notes, no. <laughs> Speaking of notes and feedback, writing articles and working with editors is yeah. it also a great way to show people I can take feedback and I can meet a deadline because those are two things you're going to have to deal with if you write for any kind of site. Mm -hmm. Free or not. Free or not. Yeah. Yeah. I guess in the new year, we could do a feedback. What? Oh, you know what we should do? don't do it but you know what we should do we should give ourselves feedback on the reckless creative podcast <laughs> from our listeners oh we should take the list we should do i want to real one day i really want to do a live reckless creatives where yeah. yes yeah we're there um audience maybe we could do it like we do the symposium like we'll just do a, a Zoom event where people don't have to be on camera. They can just be in attendance and ask questions in the Q&A. But we could also, because we what you can do in that is we can also pull them up onto the, as yeah. a panelist. So they can, at, we can ask them, if you want to be on camera, let us know, we'll pull you up. And then we can have a dialogue conversation. They can ask us a question. Yeah, that's we a might. idea. Let's do that um, in the new year. Let's do that. I think that would be a great idea. Even and if we did it, the <laughs> and then we'll get feedback. Yeah, oh, I'm scared. I'm excited. I know. Oh. So, one thing I want to say too, because I think this is super important. A lot of people think, oh, I just need to sell this screenplay. Oh, I just need to get this book published. And then I can quit this job that I hate. And... Yeah. Yeah. But no. if that happens, um, yeah, take a moment. Oh. All right, see you later, Jeannie. <laughs> no, hold on, I had to come back. Because <laughs> the you're not gonna, it's not like you sell that spec. First of all, it may not get made. Mm -hmm. And even if you spell it for like, sell it for like, spell it, even if you spell, even if you sell it for six okay. figures, right? You're not gonna get, it's not like they hand you a check for a hundred thousand dollars. Like it, that's not how it works. You're paid in little increments. And then, it, you know, this thing may never ever get made. So, yeah. Uh, don't quit your day job just yet, hard, buddy. Hard truth. Hard truth. Yeah, yeah. Get your ass back in that seat. <laughs> yeah. Please don't quit your day job just Please. yet. Please. Yeah. Because then you got to get represented and you've got, well, you probably have, you probably have a rep of your soul, but you then have to go out for writing assignments. And though that's usually the way, because also when we're talking about money, you're not going to make a living as a spec screenwriter. Like, 
the spec gets you in the door, sells your first script, then most of your money will come from writing assignments, mm -hmm. writing other people's ideas, rewriting other writers, all that kind of stuff. And those are all jobs you have to go out for and other people are going out for and you have to get picked for. It's like a constant state of being interviewed. So it could be a while before you get your next check. So, and what are you gonna do in the meantime? You could keep writing specs, but it's not like specs are, you know, there's a billion specs being sold that that kind of market is not what it used to be. Yeah. 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 It's a uh, part of me is always like, well, I have enough in savings to last me for, you know, a good three months comfortably. Maybe I'll just take that time to write. It's like, now let's be realistic. I'm going <laughs> to procrastinate. I'll write the like very last month. Um, but it's all about the hustle too and doing that and, and living, I think like living life, like having experiences, having a day job gives you opportunities to eavesdrop on people and <laughs> listen to conversations you probably wouldn't listen to at home. Oh, there's a book I wanted to pull out before the podcast. Hold please. <laughs> this is where we pause. I'm back. So one time when I was just started writing and was, you know, coming up with characters and what should they do for a living and blah, 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 blah. And then trying to think of, I'm going to find like some different jobs, some unusual jobs. Like what if, so I bought this book called Working. Mm -hmm. And see how thick it is? And wow. it basically, it says people, people talk about what they do all day and how they feel about what they do. So this has like all, and this is like not some little big wow. print here. This is some serious book. And it's like all different kinds of jobs and, all, you know, so there might be some really different, cool, wacky job you've never heard of that you're like, oh my God, I could do that. Yeah. And I mean, possibilities are endless yeah really do some research explore what makes you happy you can find something maybe you can find something that you can do part-time that pays a shit ton and and then you don't have to work full-time it's still more money that you would make if you went to mcdonald's full-time unfortunately yeah uh i always joke or at least not not always but as of recent i've been joking like if i were if i got fired from script or I quit or something happened like what would I do to focus on my creative stuff I kind of want to be a street cleaner I just want to drive the big old machine and clean the streets and make a or lot of could, money do that and after you did that I bet you could drive a Zamboni yes that would be cool Awesome. Uh, I actually went to my first hockey game ever. Uh, <gasps> I awesome. love hockey. I think we don't do sports in our home. <laughs> We're not sports watchers. Mm -hmm. We go to events with friends because it's nice to hang out. But we were invited to a hockey game and uh, yeah, we were really into it. It's, That's cool. It's really, it's really fun to watch. It's a fun sport to watch. Um, but yeah, Zambonis. I would totally be up for driving one of those too or like you know, doing pressure washing like there's something about just like seeing things clean you know what I would do um I always wanted I thought flag girl on a construction site Ooh. you know like when you're the the road construction yeah. and you're just waving the flag because you could be listening to, you could yeah. be listening to podcasts the whole time you yeah. could be dictating ideas and you've got nothing your head can be just thinking okay it might be boring yeah. as hell but yeah it could you're be cool. outside you're not stuck sitting all day cold 
It could get cold. Or a jacket. Yeah. It. I think that could be a good job. And so um, are we, Miss Jeannie, are we quitting our jobs? And Okay, I can guarantee you about right now, <laughs> Matt's probably listening to this while he's working out on the treadmill and he just fell over because he's like, <laughs> she quits. I'm going to kill her. He'll actually probably only be concerned that maybe I wouldn't I'd stop making him beef jerky. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, the other job that I would love, but it um, is uh, actually working construction. You have all the tools. I, I mean, do. I have tools. Um, and when I'm down there, the, the, when the, the place that we're renovating to downsize to, man, I just want to stay all day. <laughs> I just pop in there in the morning, see what they're doing for the day, see if there's any questions they have for me. And then I get out. I don't go every day. But um, I do just love it. Just love watching. You know, I think it's like that. It's sort of like when you're writing and everything is just a big mess. Like right now I'm at the stage where I've got all this research and it's just like a mess. Mm -hmm. And I'm organizing it. I've got the outline done. And then I have these, this other spreadsheet with all the little details I'm going to sprinkle in. That's my favorite part sprinkling in all the little details and and really adding layers to it so when you're working construction and you see them just put up the studs or they put up the sheetrock or they put you know whatever it's like oh yeah i guess this kind of looks okay <laughs> then they start adding the baseboards and the crown molding and the little trim and it's like oh my god this is gorgeous and you see it kind of all come to life and then I, and i watch my contractor who's a perfectionist and very you know, he really has a high work ethic. And I watch him just look and say, like, if there's something that the, the house was built in 1780, so there's issues. So mm -hmm. if there's something that's like the trim around a window, you know, we're mm -hmm. just doing all cosmetic stuff. So the trim around the window and they see, he's like, oh, there's a little gap there. It doesn't really look that great. To him, that's like his rewriting. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to make this better. I'm going to make this, you know, flow better, work better, have people, I want people to walk in. I mean, those kinds of things are like akin to our writing voice. Mm -hmm. You know, like he's like, I wouldn't want somebody to think I built that. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so I really respect it. And there's a lot of similarities to it, you know, so you should all and I will construction workers then to understand structure. <laughs> I was going to say box. Yeah, so I was gonna say I was. I'm trying to avoid making that dumb joke. <laughs> not dumb. No, it's, it's not structure. Structure, because it all makes it hold up. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just held this book up so the people who aren't watching on YouTube, because I don't think I put the last episode up on YouTube. I don't remember to show how strong you are because it's a big book. It's really like, I'm working out. Yeah. <laughs> I'm working out, get it? The name is working. It's by Studs Turkle, which is kind of fun just to say, is that really someone's name, Studs Turkle? That's their name. And they're owning it. Like, look how big their name I is. I know. They own book. that. <laughs> I want to talk to Studs' mom. Yeah. I wonder if Studs is a construction worker. There is a hammer on that cover, so. Yeah, maybe. there's, and a nail, the nail down here. And there's the stud. And he is a stud. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, there's Studs. Can you see? Oh, yeah. Look at that see? guy. Doug <laughs> Turkle is the author of 11 books. Wow. Of oral history, including Hope Dies Last and the Pulitzer Prize winning The Good War. He's a member of the Academy of Arts and Letters and a recipient of the Presidential National Humanities Medal, the National Book Foundation Medal, and a distinguished contribu contribution to American letters. The George Polk Career Award and National Book Critics Circle, Ivan Sandroff Lifetime Achievement Award. 
studs is the man. Yeah. Yeah. That's so quite- I'm thinking with all that writing studs might have had some pretty good day jobs. Yeah. Or studs had a wonderful partner to support studs creativity. I think I'm going to look studs up today. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we could get him on reckless creatives. <laughs> Studs circle. Let's talk. Yeah. Let's but talk. everyone should buy Studs book. This is actually, I think, a few books together. Because like this one, I think he's got multiple books in here that are all merged together. That's why it's so big. Like this page at the end says book nine. So there must be a bunch of books that are all. Nine books in one. There might be a 10. I don't know. I didn't go back that far. I just pulled that page and there you go. So there it is. Um, so money. Yeah. That's our two cents. That's it. On that. <laughs> do, do, do. That was easy. Could you hear that? Yeah. <laughs> when Hi. I was, when I was clean, cleaning out stuff, I found my staples. That was easy, but so it is now going to be part of Reckless Creatives. Fantastic. Uh, well, I think this is our last episode before the holidays. So, yeah. Happy, Happy holidays. holidays. You too. And everybody yeah. should take some time to ignore their family. <laughs> and right. <laughs> <just> said, no. <laughs> but I also said, no. Everything that Judy just said for the last hour, ignore it. Uh, okay pay attention to them <laughs> no, and you I, know what it's good to take some time off recharge yeah don't feel guilty about it no you want to um i'll share this with all of our listeners uh because i think it's funny uh so i have time off for the holidays the company will be closed i haven't had this much time off in like ever for a day job and uh, I was talking to them. Yeah, like, well, I do. I do are, love that. I do. I, what are you? Gonna, what are you going to do for that week? I'm like, I don't know. Like, uh, are we just saving back for my in-laws? So maybe just like some house stuff, whatever. Or maybe I'll just like do some creative stuff. I don't know yet. Um, hopefully, I'm not bored. And uh, I got a jury summons Saturday. <laughs> so for that week <laughs> that I'm off, I may be doing jury duty. So okay. Okay, let's just stop. Hold the presses. Jury duty is awesome. I, I, people always try to get out of it. Yeah. But there's all this opportunity to people watch when you're sitting there waiting. Also, let's just say most of the time in New York anyway, you don't have to go in because you call up to see if your number is there. And so sometimes you don't even have to drive your butt to the down to the courthouse yeah but i did and i got picked as an alternate for a manslaughter case and it was really cool experience and um plus it's your civic duty yeah so and you could see people in the room doing everything they could to get out of it and and i'm thinking you know this 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 man deserves thoughtful, intelligent, honest people sitting in the jury deciding his fate. Like, wouldn't, I guess I looked at it as, wouldn't I want me in that jury box? Mm -hmm. And so I'm a big fan of jury duty and I just go when I'm called. All right. Well, if it's a complete disaster and I hate it, I blame you. I accept the blame. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. No, I'm excited. It's my um my first one, possibly. So I'll keep you posted. But I just thought it was kind of funny that I couldn't figure out what I was going to do. And it was like, the state figured it out for me. That is funny <laughs> and <laughs> kind of sad. But yeah. you're, there's a lot of waiting. So bring your, sure. yeah. bring your laptop, bring a book. You know, there's a lot of waiting. Yeah. I mean... I mean, I'm going to just be honest. I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't be doing anything. I'd probably be just sitting on my couch 
glued to my TV and reading and napping. So this is fine. That's good. <laughs> awesome. So, and hanging out with Nick Cage. Yeah, exactly. You know, maybe you should have put some little Christmas hats on him. Next time. I, I honestly forgot that he's that there. That up. Yeah. It well, surprises it, me every time. Okay. Here's what's funny is that you meet with your writing partner on Sundays and that's what that thing is. And today's mm-hmm. Monday. So how bad is your memory? <laughs> it's pretty bad, actually. Uh, I, I, I don't know what it is. It's been like deteriorating the last this last year I feel like you're busy just my my brain is just dead (laughs) well we would like you to think long and hard about all the things we talked about with jobs so that your brain is not also dead yeah and you have space for creativity yeah do it listen listen to Jeannie's advice and then you're going to come home from your job and you're going to say, That was easy. <laughs> there you go. The end. The end. Reckless Creatives is a Pipeline Artist original podcast. Like, subscribe, and follow us on social media at Pipeline Artists. And find more info at pipelineartists.com slash listen. Until next time, stay reckless.